good. We've got Derby's arrived, that's great. And Albany. And Albany, that's fantastic. We've got a few more going to sort of meet and greet us in a very short, short t- uh, time frame. So um, what I've titled uh, this today, and uh, we'll get on with our presentation, is just looking at whether we've got CTG monitoring right. So I just wanted to begin just by reading this little bit out and then I'll get on with the presentation. So it's a little abstract that I'm going to use uh, called The Dirty Dozen, and some of you may have already actually uh, seen it or read it, uh, but it's the contribution of human factors to errors and adverse outcomes with most healthcare systems cannot be underestimated. So even since 1960, that's when we started with our CTGs, it's not reduced the rate of hypoxia-induced perinatal morbidity or mortality. So what we're working with hasn't really improved anything. And this is based on a bit of research that's worth looking up called uh, Each Baby Counts. And it still indicates that 62% of stillbirths and neonatal deaths and brain injuries were related in 2015 to, to um, errors in CTG interpretation and management. So that's what I've based today on, and I'm going to just begin by just going through um, some of the things that they've identified. Um, we're just going to pop this PowerPoint presentation up for you so you can see. Thanks, Julie. That's great. Just that one here. This one? No. That one? Yes. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so you can't see me, you can just see the screen now. So I'm just going to look at some of the things that perhaps have caused a problem or are still causing problems for us with CTG monitoring. So we've, we've actually discovered that it's much bigger than what we th- first thought. So what I'm going to do, this, this little presentation is in two parts. First of all, I'm actually going to um, just concentrate on some of the things that they've kind of gathered from this little bit of work. Uh, that could be a problem for all of us. And then the second part, I'm actually going to go through um, a few um, CTG case studies, if you like, so that we can see what um, sort of learn from those. And if you want to call in or if you want to actually make any comments, feel free to unmute and uh, interrupt me. I don't mind. So this is just to introduce you to um, who I am a little bit. I'm married to Phil. Um, I always tell everybody I married the right man because I've ended up with a terrible name, Joan Jones. Uh, but we've got four children, four grandchildren, well actually five grandchildren, we just got another one this last week or two. And uh, we love to travel, so that's just a little bit about me. And that's our uh, little trip to New Zealand that we had last year, which was fabulous. So that's much more interesting than this, but we've got to do this today. So this is a guy called Gordon Dupont who actually looked at some of the things that might cause us problems, um, and, and particularly problems in looking at CTG monitoring. And it was um, he actually did quite a bit of work, and it's worth having a little look to see what sort of work he did. Uh, but these are the things that we're just going to look at today. And what I want you to do is you've got a little piece of paper, or if you've got Um, just a little pen and paper if you've got just a little bit of scrap paper as we go through these just give them a rate of what you think one to five is a problem in your area and we'll have a little discussion around that sort of later on so um, one being no problem and five being quite a big problem in, in the unit that you're working in so just let's have a little look and see what's going on so the first thing is lack of communication or lack of effective communication and um, and one of the things that we're up against sometimes is actually our use of language. And sometimes we're actually also influenced by the way people speak to us. So um, it's, it's not just to do with words, it's to do with body language also. So something that might be said is, this trace looks normal. Don't you think this trace looks normal? So there's kind of like a confirmation bias where people actually um, sort of influence our thinking, if you like. And one of the things that we need to do is be independent thinkers and and actually look at this in a more appropriate way. So um, with that can actually sort of like the, the, um, the influence or the confirmation bias can bring with it um, the lack of appropriate es- escalation. So um, when that happens, then often we don't get a brilliant outcome. 
So um, lack of effective communication needs to be, if you can just actually um, sort of actively score it on your scrap piece of paper and, uh, and either one to five. Is that a problem in your department or not a problem in where you're working clinically? So one of the things that we've sort of introduced that's been really well adopted is, is using the helpful tools in communication. So I don't think there's anywhere around the state now that doesn't actually use Dr. C. Bravado and, and also SBAR, which is Situation, Background, Assessment and, re, and Recall. So, um, so I think we're all pretty good at using those tools and th those tools have been incredibly effective um, in actually sort of helping us out. So um, just that confirmation bias, we all work together, we kind of like work together, we've got like uh, work colleagues who become our friends also uh, and who influence each other and also there's, a, there's an element of hierarchy there too. So um, just that sort of language, you've got to give people a chance to actually make their own decision about things. So that's the first one. The second thing is complacency. Um, there, there's an element of complacency if we work in an area too long. We become actually sort of overconfident. We've seen it all before and it can be that slow, insidious sort of error that sort of like uh, creeps in. And so with that, um, um, whoever's just joined us, can you just welcome, but can you just mute your button for me? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just, your button just needs muting, thanks. So, um, so there's that complacency, it comes often just with that sort of, I've seen it all before, that overconfidence and there's also a kind of a little bit of a question mark or a little bit of an exclamation mark rather with our design stickers because a lot of us are using stickers um, just to actually do our Dr. C. Bravado or um, do our assessment and uh, sometimes we get, pr we get kind of a bit fixed by just filling in boxes rather than thinking about um, not thinking about the CTG. So I want, to, I want to get you to swap a little bit from actually thinking about how is the CTG trace or what does the CTG trace rather swap it to thinking about how is the baby. So that's your first little take home message today is rather than just thinking about the CTG trace, actually thinking about how is the baby going, how is the baby travelling, how is the baby. And you've got to have that big picture thinking uh, for this. So the big picture thinking has actually got to include the whole story, which I think as midwives and as doctors, we're actually quite good at looking at the whole story. And, um, and it's got, that's something that you've got to actually really base your thinking about. First of all, how is the baby? And think about what has that baby been subjected to? Uh, is, it in, is it in an environment that's really healthy for it or is it in an unhealthy environment? So just sort of like consider that complacency for you as an individual, uh, just you don't have to share this, but whether it's an issue between one and five, one being not an issue at all and five being it is an issue. So the next thing is lack of knowledge and um, this is part of what we're still fighting and still trying to actually um, come to terms with if you like or trying to address as educators is that lack of knowledge. And, and what we're trying to do is actually getting people or getting midwives and getting doctors to really understand fetal physiology. And I think, um, I think we're doing a much better job with FSEP and we're doing a really great job with advanced fetal assessment and K2. So I think our knowledge base is beginning to improve. Um, but sometimes we're still not getting our head round the whole picture. So I just thought I'd share a little bit of a story from my own clinical background because I still work as a clinical midwife um, just part-time and I work as a midwifery educator part-time. So this happened last November. Uh, we had a woman that came in and she was term plus 10 and uh, the baby's heart rate was between, it was 158. Uh, but when you think about the physiology and you think about the progression of the uh, parasympathetic nervous system continuing to develop, that baseline rate really should be coming down for a baby that's turned plus 10. And, um, and again, if you think about the baseline rate that for a less than a 34-week gestation baby, which is quite low, um, you should be considering, well, that's not quite right for that baby. That baby's parasympathetic nervous system has got to continue to develop and it should really have a higher baseline rate than that. 
So what I'm trying to get you all to do is actually think a bit wider, think a bit broader, think about that individual baby. The baby that I dealt with, which was term plus 10 and had a baseline rate of 150, was actually quite unwell. And, um, and for me it was quite a, um, it didn't have great um, blood gases when it, was at, when it actually arrived. So just, just to sort of bear in mind that you've got to consider the whole picture and consider each of those babies. Even though we've got this baseline rate being normal between 110 and 160, consider the gestation of the baby, consider the fetal physiology behind it all. So again, just score that, just score that again, your lack of knowledge. Uh, if your knowledge is absolutely brilliant, score it at five, and if you feel that you've got a lack of knowledge, score it a bit lower. And we're not going to sort of examine each of you, we're just going to actually have a, a chat about it later. So the next thing is distraction, and I think this is probably one uh, for all of us that actually is a real challenge. I think you would all agree this is a massive challenge because we've all got such competing clinical demand now. And so a distraction is anything at all that takes your mind off the task of caring for a woman in labour or caring for an antenatal patient um, or anything at all that would actually distract you. So the, the thing that I've actually just sort of put up here just for you to consider is actually when, we, when there's a placement of an epidural. Um, it's inherently difficult to actually trace that baby while an epidural has actually been inserted. And it's typically the time when that CTG is neglected. And, um, and it's typically, again, thinking about that physiology for that baby. Um, there's a potential that while that's happening, uh, things can be changing sort of in utero. Um, the, the blood pressure of the mum might be altered. All those things, consider that and consider the physiology of what will happen to that placental perfusion. So um, one of the things that we've got to actually really be more vigilant at is actually during that placement of the epidural in some shape or form, form um, capturing that fetal heart rate. So that distraction, it can be in any form. So again, as, a, as an individual, as a clinician, just, um, just actually sort of like just give yourself one to five. Are you easily distracted, which would be a five. If you're not easily distracted and you're good at staying on task, give yourself a zero or a one. So we know that teams change. Um, I think working in the rural and the uh, rural sector, I think your teams, uh, they don't change dramatically, but people come and go a little bit. And uh, you probably have more of a solid team than, um, than different places. But teams do change. And uh, sometimes, um, the, for, for myself, they change quite quickly. And so one of the things that there is a suggestion, if, you, if you're in a situation where your teams are changing quite quickly, is to have an introduction at the start of each shift. So wherever you are, just uh, it only takes two minutes just to say who you are and uh, where you've come from. And uh, I always, as a coordinator, um, just give them an opportunity to say what is your expertise, where are you really comfortable working. And then the other part of it, of, with lack of teamwork, is, is actually introducing that multidisciplinary um, simulation training on a regular basis. And on a regular basis is really important. And um, the evidence shows that if you don't do any simulated training on a three-monthly basis, then your actual clinical skills working as part of a team actually diminish after three months. So what I suggest is you mark in your calendar that every three months you should actually introduce some sort of multidisciplinary simulated training. It doesn't have to be massive, it can just be a small thing, but it's something that we should do as a team. It just inc improves our teamwork um, wholeheartedly. So this is just a relaxing picture, just to sort of like um, give you a little, a little bit of a view of what teamwork uh, could look like. Um, so that everybody's actually working together. And, it's a, and as you can see, it says no left foot, right foot, yeah, right, right there, now everybody together. So, um, so we can all sort of work, we can improve on our teamwork if you like. This one is a massive one for all of us again, um, is fatigue. Um, it's, it's come up quite regularly in some of our, um, some of our, Situations that we've looked at, where we've had um, situations that have had 
unexpected outcomes or some things have been missed or things haven't gone well or we've had a, an outcome that's less than acceptable is fatigue and uh, it's none of us are actually immune from civic fatigue all of us will get fatigued at times but the actual um, the actual recommendation is that you're actually in tune with your own body and your own mind and your own physique if you like and that you should be actually identifying when you are fatigued, mentally or physically. And so the evidence again shows that that um, circadian low comes between 2 and 6 in the morning, something to be aware of for people that work night duty and all of us are still, most of us are still working night duty. And also that 50% of births following a spontaneous labour occur between 1 and 7. So again, it's times that we should really be um, sort of like um, aware of that and that we should be, um, I know that rest breaks during a shift sometimes are impossible to find, but even a 10 minute break can revive you. And, and also the adequate staffing levels, which again, for hot potato, we know that the unions are still working really hard to try and sort of look at some of these um, issues too. So um, I know that these are difficult and I know that there's no quick fix, but I think all of us need to be aware of our own fatigue levels and identify them. So again, just one to five, um, whether you're aware of your own fatigue. This is always an issue too, quite a challenge is lack of resources. Um, we do really well at sort of diligently checking our stocks. I think we're pretty good at diligently checking things. But some things break, don't they, and some things are not available. And one of the things that we're still up against is actually uh, just having the right machines that actually match the right equipment. And I don't know however, uh, whether anybody else has got problems like this. Um, I just put this in because I've, it's something that I've experienced because we've got a variety of um, CTG monitors where I work. Uh, it's just making sure that they're compatible, you, your scalp electrodes are compatible with your CTG monitors. So again, um, just score it. Do you have problems with lack of resources or not? Um, pressure. Sometimes we put our pressure on ourselves, don't we, with uh, self-pressure. Sometimes we sort of, um, we don't see it as a strength, if you like, to ask for help. Uh, we see it as, uh, as if we're incompetent if we're asking for help. But it's really a strength. It's something that we've got to identify as a strength. And, uh, and part of that is um, looking at effective prioritisation of what your tasks are and what you need to do. And also that dele delegation of tasks. And um, and ask for help when you need it. And even when you've kind of like got to actually sort of like pull people in for, from off-site, that escalation to senior member of team, even if off-site, uh, and it's a, an appropriate thing to do. So just identify that too. Just make sure that you've actually got um, effective prioritization and delegation of tasks. And just look at your own self-pressure. Do you put too much self-pressure on? Um, do you ask for help when you need it? Just score that bit. Am I good at asking for help or am I um, not that great at asking for help when I'm under pressure? This, I think, is becoming less of an issue. Um, I think people have become very, very aware of hierarchy. Um, and I actually, whenever I visit the rural sites, I always think you've actually got this right. Um, that you're, you're actually um, you're actually able to speak up a lot more. Um, it's welcomed a lot more in the community of rural setting and remote setting than it perhaps is when you come to a tertiary site. It's something that King Edward was still actually really working hard at. Uh, but breaking down that um, chain of command is is really essential. Um, we need to develop that culture where you kind of like applauded and that you're actually um, you're commended when you do speak up. So um, I think we are working really hard at King Edward with this and, um, and I'm sure that sort of from your different sites that you're working at, um, that failing to speak up when things don't seem right is something that's really, really encouraged. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're just kind of one of the student midwives or whether you're just, well, not just, whether you're a student midwife or you're new in your practice, and that failing to speak up when things don't seem right is completely and utterly the wrong thing to do. You must speak up. And none of us are going to ever be 100% right. So it doesn't matter if you speak up and it actually isn't the right, um, it's not required. Uh, what is actually uh, really important is that you're actually received with an applaud 
um, with an absolute encouragement and that was great that you spoke up when you didn't think things were right. <clears throat> so from from a perspective of being um, a, a midwife that's been employed for a long number of years, if you like, or an experienced midwife, if a junior member of staff actually does speak up uh, and challenge you, then always, always applaud them and, and uh, thank them for that, whether they're right or wrong. Stress is another part. Uh, I suppose it's linked with fatigue, if you like. Um, and it's, uh, we're all, stress is good, uh, sort of to a certain level. We all need a, a certain amount of stress, but then when it gets excessive, it can lead to sort of us making mistakes. And we're human and we will make mistakes. And it is our subconscious sub, um, response to the demands that are placed upon us. And um, so it, it is always going to be an issue. Um, some people have got amazing resilience to stress and some people have got less resilience. Uh, but it can cause us to be, become distracted. It can cause us to actually be able to, not to be able to perform uh, complex tasks. And uh, the com one of the complex tasks we know is actually interpretation and management of CTGs. So that recognition of stress is really, really important that we actually get that right too. This one's an interesting one, this lack of awareness, lack of vigilance, and it's linked with that complacency and it's, it's also with that lack of situ situational awareness. And it can be combined with lack of knowledge, stress and fatigue. So, these things are, even though it's called the dirty dozen, these things are all interlinked. They're all sort of like quite interlinked with each other, uh, that lack of awareness. And we all know that we can actually become really focused on one area and then actually sort of not become aware of what else is going on in our, in our unit. And um, so this next slide is a nice little slide to actually sort of give you that um, sort of lack of awareness. Um, <laughs> it's obviously a safari where, you know, did you see the lion? No, oh, that's bad luck, and there he is right behind you. And so sometimes on our units, when we get really uh, immersed in one area, uh, then that lack of awareness or situational awareness actually is a, is a problem. And I'll just tell you a little story. Um, if you call, if I've got a non-breathing baby that's born and I need a team to help me, um, then I actually um, hit the bell and a team from ED come up to help me because I don't work at Rockingham, I work somewhere else. So the team come up from ED to, to help and there was, um, and, and also if I've got somebody that's got a postpartum hemorrhage, I do the same, just hit the bell and get the big team from, uh, from downstairs. So uh, a few weeks ago there was a woman that was uh, in a postpartum hemorrhage so I hit the bell. But I actually put, just put the baby onto the, um, just to keep the baby safe, I put the baby onto the resuscitator because the dad was feeling a bit faint. And the whole team ran in and they ran for the baby. The baby was uh, transitioned into life, it was breathing and it was happy. And I needed the team to come and help with the postpartum hemorrhage. So that was like a little bit of um, situational awareness. They saw the baby on the resuscitator and in their mind they clicked that the baby needed help. They didn't click that I needed help with the woman. So it's just, again, that's just a little example of sometimes um, we, we just make assumptions and we actually get it wrong. So norms are another one of the dirty dozen. Norms are unwritten rules. Um, and you'll have them everywhere you work, you'll have norms as unwritten rules. And they're kind of followed and tolerated. It's part of your culture. And sometimes we get that higher tolerance of an abnormal CTG in the second stage. And again, back to thinking about the baby, back to thinking about the um, situation that the baby's in. Does it have great reserve during the second stage? Some, ba some babies that are well-grown, healthy term babies do have great reserve. Uh, babies that, do, that are not well grown, that are perhaps small for gestational age or premature or um, have not got, uh, or a mum that's got lots of comorbidities, they have got much lesser tolerance in that second stage. So um, just thinking about unwritten, unwritten rules, uh, you'll find that you will have norms everywhere you go. Um, so uh, just a reminder, the interpretation of the CTG in the first or the second stage, they're the same, it's the same interpretation. Right, I'm just going to pause there because I've talked for a little while and uh, I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to get rid of this second and I'm just going to have a little chat.
Okay, so we've got quite a few uh, little groups together today, which is lovely to see. Um, so what I'm, I might do is I might just ask for uh, the first one. Did anybody score on the first one, lack of communication? Anybody score on that that would like to share with me? Just jump in. Just give me a number. No, nobody's given me a number. I have to pick on you. Okay. okay. Um, hi, I'm Elizabeth, um, clinical midwife from Derby Hospital. I would rate it between a three and a four for my oh. hospital. And um, yeah, M most of the time, I think um, what we are facing with is um, we have. We have no permanent DMO, uh, ops DMO, so it's always we are run by rotating two weeks, three weeks um, rotating DMOs uh, for obstetric, and that make it very hard in terms of um, um, communication when the DMO is on how much they actually know the background of the woman and things like that, and sometimes. Um, communications between DMOs and incoming and outgoing is not great and also between midwife and DMOs and everything else so I would rate my hospital between a three and a four. My, that's my opinion. Thank yeah, thanks very much for your honesty, that's beautiful, thank you. Just staying with that, um, that's Debbie, Debbie that's talking, just staying with that if we look on our list again, um, it's, I think that team, um, the sort of lack of teamwork would come into that derby because of your transient staff. So uh, one of your take home messages would be to actually introduce yourself at the beginning of each shift. And when I say introduce yourself, what I actually do with the team, that I, cause I'm the same, where I work, our team swaps and changes all the time. And what's a really lovely thing to do is say, where are you most comfortable working during that time? What have you got to bring today? And some people are really comfortable with neonatal resuscitation, some people are really comfortable with birthing, with postnatal care, whatever it is. Um, just give them a chance to excel, say where they are when they're in their element. So thanks for that, that's great. So. Um, I think we can only get better with communication. Is there anybody that's actually uh, with lack of communication, with one being sort of like uh, the least of a problem? Has anybody scored one or two? Just jump in. Yeah, Kununura? Beautiful. All right. What did you score, Kununura? Where are you? Three, yeah. Yeah, yeah. go on, off you go. So what did you score, Kununura, for your communication? We scored a three, two to three. A three, a two, three, yeah, that's lovely. Have you got the same issue as Derby, just sort of that transient staff that come and go a little bit? Um. Yes and no, I think the transient staff are probably better than the long-termers. Yeah, yeah. I think the younger generation coming through, this is my only bit of experience, is they're actually pretty good at communication. The girls straight out of uni are being drilled by it so so tightly that they're actually doing quite well. Yeah. Narajan, you've got something to say. Narajan? No? Yeah, they have, yeah. What were you? Narrow I gym? think we yeah. about a, 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 a two, I think. I think um, we have a pretty, um, uh, the same cohort here. We've had a couple of agency staff coming through, but they're usually pretty up to speed yeah. with everything. So I think communication, Lovely. we have lines of communication with our GPOs. Fantastic. And I think probably that brings it brings me into like thinking about communication. 
it's kind of like you almost have to earn the right to um, gain that respect, don't you? And the only way you're going to do that is actually by chatting to each other, talking to each other, and, and actually um, sort of like respecting each other. We don't have to like everybody we work with, but we have to actually respect everybody we work with. Yeah. All right. So just. Um, looking at all the different things that we've, I'm not going to go through all 12 because we haven't really got the time, but I thought communication was worth a look. And I think the next one that's worth a look is lack of, uh, is teamwork. Um, out of uh, sort of like looking at teamwork, who's got um, a five for teamwork? They feel that they're doing pretty well in the area that they're working in. Has anybody got a four or five for teamwork? Albany, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Just unmute your button, Albany. Just knowledge. Yeah, go on. Um, for our teamwork, we think we do a great job um, and scored ourselves yeah. a one. Fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah, I think um, I think that's a really. Um, I, I've heard great things about all around our state actually for teamwork. And I've only got very minimal sort of experience of coming to places like Albany and Esperance and different places. But I think you've actually got it sorted because you rely so much on each other. One of the things about teamwork is having each other's back. And I think you do it really well. So I don't think that's an issue for people around there. I think they do pretty well. Absolutely. And um, I think that one of the really nice things about the hospital that we work in at the moment is if we... As an example, we don't have uh, the doctors on site all of the time and if I pick up the phone at 3 in the morning and say to my doctor, Doctor, I'm not happy with my CTG, they will come very quickly because the team works so well together. Yeah, and you've earned that because of your respect from each other, you know, that relationship that you have, that professional relationship you have, uh, you earn that, so that's fantastic, that's really good to hear. Yeah, that's great. Um, is there anybody that wants to actually jump in talking about fatigue and stress? Or is that a hot topic that people don't want to talk about? Anybody scored um, high on that? No? We'll leave that one if nobody wants to jump in. Oh, yes, Derby, um, yeah. Derby, yes. Um, we were discussing, and I think it depends on um, who is on what midwives and what yeah. doctors. <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, we, we find that a lot of time, we, sometimes with our uh, short-term midwife, um, they, they, did, they did bring up that communication is not great, probably because they are short-term, they are deemed yeah. to be a little bit more junior, and sometimes the communication yeah. is not great when they're discussing CTG, abnormal CTG, where the doctors may bring it to the consultant and the midwife is basically could be kept out of the discussion and then they decide something higher up and with basically no discussion, no consultation with the midwife who most of the time who know, will know the background of the woman much better than the rotating doctors. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that is the issue we face. But I want to say it depends on yeah. who. Yeah, it depends on who is on shift. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think I think for all of us, sometimes I mostly do labour ward. For all of us, we walk on duty and we look and we know that our shift is going to be easy, or we walk on duty and we know that we're going to be challenged that shift, depending on the team of people we're working with. But it's, it's going back to what I said originally. We don't have to like everybody that we work with, but we've got to respect everybody that we work with, and uh, we just do the best we can, don't we, in all situations. But I do actually think that we could do better at actually doing uh, small simulated training sessions multidisciplinary. I don't know how you're going to fit it into your busy life, but it does seem to make a massive difference to all of this. You know, it really does. And um, I think it kind of like it cuts across quite a lot of um, sort of issues that we've got around about CTG monitoring. So um, has there anybody, dare anybody share with me that they've got regularly, they're regularly meeting together as a multidisciplinary team to do simulated training in any shape or form? Or is it still an issue that people are not managing to get to? No, there's a few shaking of heads. No. Yeah. It is uh, difficult. We, 
<laughs> yes, we do do uh, weekly weekly, weekly uh, discussion, and uh, whenever times permit, we we do have our consultant visiting us once a month for their gynae <laughs> appointment, <laughs> and we try to use one of the session. Uh, we did it only once or twice. Uh, with uh, looking into CTG that we we like we have queries. So we run by the consultant in our meeting, yeah. Yeah, lovely. And that, if you can't get that multidisciplinary togetherness, then you can actually do just what David just, David just sort of mentioned, is just getting together for a 10 minute discuss, let's discuss how this was managed. Could we have done anything different or better or have we learned anything from it? Okay. Time's marching and I want to just spend two thirty minutes. So just um, yeah, just before I get back onto the presentation, what I'm going to do is just um, this this actual um, this actual article. I'll actually give it I'll give it to um, Julie, and she can circulate it around so you can read it yourselves uh, if you want to, or you know it can be emailed out to each of the people that are on the bridge today. So what I might do now is I might just come back onto the PowerPoint. And what I wanted to do is just look at, I think I've got four traces, um, and I wanted to actually, um, I wanted to involve you in actually commenting on them. So let's see how this works. We'll have a go. We'll have, give it a go. <laughs> Okay, so this next bit is just after the questions, it's just a summary um, from the first session, which is care for yourself, make sure that you're not stressed, fatigued or worn out, uh, make sure that you've got that fetal physiology firmly in your mind, you actually know all about fetal physiology, and, and you can't not actually manage that now, we've got all these resources with FSEP, with K2, with um, some great, there's some, a great book from Ranscock that you can buy, it's only about $40. Um, it's on their site if you want it. Uh, understand that CTG changes might be caused by infection, inflammation, not only hypoxia, something to bear in mind. And keep asking how is the baby and use fresh eyes um, and break down, you know, just sort of like have people come not influenced by your interpretation, but they come in and you don't influence them and you allow them to make an assessment themselves. Break down that hierarchical, hierarchical boundaries, which you manage well, and get that escalation as appropriate. And just avoid those negative norms and just care for yourself. I've said that twice. It's important. Whether you like it or not, we've all got to work till we're quite sort of like well into our 60s now. <laughs> so this first trace. So it's a 24-year-old lady, she's a gravity 2 para 1, she's term plus 5, she's had a very straightforward pregnancy and she's come to the assessment unit at, at King Edward for a, um, just for a CTG post-mature pregnancy. What, what risks for the baby? Jump in and just say what they are. What risks can you see with that? Just unmute your buttons. Post-dates. Post-dates. Post yeah, yeah, thank you for that. That's beautiful. Yeah, just post-dates. That's the only thing that's a problem, isn't it, here? And I don't know what's happening out in the sticks, but we're looking at term plus five now as being post-dates. It used to be term plus ten, but it's come down quite a bit, hasn't it? And it's, the reason for that is the graph. If you look at the graph of stillborn babies, it goes up remarkably after term plus five. So everybody gets a little jittery, don't they, about it. So this is the trace that you're faced with. So the person that's not um, jumped in before, um, you don't have to do a Dr. C. Bravado on that trace. Can you just, somebody can just say normal or abnormal? Normal. Absolutely normal. So the management for that, and it, you can see this trace, we've got about 27 minutes of trace here. And what happens next is the baby will go to sleep after that. But if you've got normal baseline rate, normal variability, two accelerations in 20 minutes, you can firmly and quite confidently say to that woman, I can say to you 
um, I've got 99% um, sure that your baby is in a well oxygenated, happy, well fed place at this point in time, which is a really beautiful thing for a woman to hear because um, she actually is quite stressed about the new tray. So it's a really beautiful thing to be able to say to a woman. So what happens next is they, they don't take the trace off at that point, they leave it on and what's this now, what's this part of the trace? It's a sleep trace, so then you've got to wait for your accelerations to come again. So take it off when you've got those features, take it off when you've got everything that you need to see. It might only take you 15 minutes to get that, take it off, you know that you've got all the features that you actually, that you actually require. So then what happened is they made a plan, uh, they sent her home, and she's got to come back for induction of labour. And so she goes home, uh, happy that her baby's well, and then she goes into spontaneous labour the next day. She has a normal birth, normal apgars, and she goes home after six hours, and she's got normal blood gases. So that's a really nice outcome and that's a really um, easy one to go with. So that's trace number one. So just going back, <clears throat> normal healthy baby, just a little bit post-mature, uh, a well-grown baby gives you all these beautiful features, um, a plan is made for her to come in for induction, comes into spontaneous labour and has a nice normal out outcome. That's an antenatal trace. This next one. <clears throat> is um, a 28 year old lady, she's, um, it's a second pregnancy but she's the primary, she's not birthed a baby yet. She's got 30 plus one gestation baby born, a uh, baby uh, that she's pregnant with, uneventful pregnancy but she comes into the maternal and fetal assessment unit with a history of diminished fetal movement. Somebody jump in and give me the risk factors. What's the risk for this baby? Decreased fetal movement from premature. Yeah, just stay on the line for a little minute or two. What sort of things are, uh, what's the problem with a premature baby? Just stay on the um, line so, and tell me. So if we've got decreased fetal movements at this stage compared to her normal of this pregnancy, is there something that's a problem? Is the placenta insufficient? Yeah. Does it need to be delivered? Yeah. What? Centre yeah. are we birthing in? Can we manage a 30 plus one weaker? Do we need yeah. to look at transferring them out? Um, how long will that take? Where will they go? Family, culture? Yeah, you've got such a big picture to think of. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. So we know we've not got a well-grown baby. It's, well, it may be well-grown to 30 weeks, but it's not a mature baby. And we're all quite jittery about diminished fetal movement because we know that um, if you let a child play in the playground and he's leaping around and sort of doing great things, he's in a well, he's well and healthy. If he's lying under a tree asleep, we know that he's not very good. So it's the same with the baby in utero. So this is what we see. So somebody else, um, so at the minute, um, this is the trace that we see, normal baseline rate, um, normal variability, but no accelerations that we can see, that's probably a better state. So what do you think, somebody else jump in and, and um, come in and say, say what do you think about that trace? What sort of things are you thinking? First of all, it's an antenatal trace. Is it normal or abnormal? Somebody abnormal. jump in and just give me that. Abnormal. Just abnormal, thank you. Which is difficult now, isn't it? You know, using our Ramscog uh, terminology, that comes under abnormal trace, doesn't it? So let's see. The reason it's abnormal is um, we've got no um, defined acceleration. And, but the thing is, we've got a 30-week gestation baby, haven't we? And we know, thinking about your physiology again, we know with physiology, um, with, a, with a, a baby that's that gestation, it may not um, sort of like have um, accelerations, may not, at 30-week gestation. But the problem is we've got, we've got diminished fetal movement. So what is your management going to be? What are you going to do? Ultrasound? 
Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, what a great idea. Let's do some ultrasound. So they do some ultrasound. That's a brilliant idea. And I don't know how easy it is for where you will, where you're working to get ultrasound, but that's what they do. They get some ultrasound. So, um, so the ultrasound showed normal. Oh, sorry. It showed normal growth interval, and then she went. Um, she had weekly CTGs with because the, all the CTGs were abnormal, so she was 34 weeks. Then after 34 weeks, she got normal CTGs, and then at 38 weeks, she had a normal um, sort of spontaneous onset of labour, SVD, good APGARs, normal blood gases. So all really good. So what probably that what I'm trying to do with that one is just actually remind you that at 30 week gestation and diminished fetal movement and an abnormal trace, you've got to get some ultrasounds on board, you've got to do some serial growth. But you can't just uh, jump to sort of like massive conclusions. You've got to get more than a CTG to look at that. But that was a perfect management. Thank you. Okay. So the next one. This lady, she's 36. She's a primate. Um, she had a miscarriage, so she's covered a two paranaut. She's booked with midwifery group practice. She's an A negative blood, blood group. Um, she's had her anti D during a 28 and 34 week gestation. She's got a normal GTT. She's had an uneventful pregnancy. So, from that, um, is there anything at all that you could actually sort of think, oh, we've got some alarm bells raised for this baby? Mature Nothing primate. much there. Say that again. Mature primate, please. Yeah, elderly primate, that's the only thing. And that's what we're dealing with all the time now, isn't it? Um, a woman who has a massive career, um, gets rid of a bit of a mortgage, uh, uh, gets into this environment where she now decides she's ready for a baby. Um, but we know the reality is that between 18 and 24, physically, is probably the best stage. So this is what we see when she comes into MAFA, because she came self-referred to MAFA, with, again, with reduced movements at 37 weeks. And um, and actually that non well it's actually an abnormal trace sorry that should be changed to an abnormal tra uh, trace despite position change and rehydration so um, the, they decide to do that bedside ultrasound when they see this because there's no a non ultrasound she's got normal AFI but there's no head or trunk movement seen and the patient's teary and she doesn't want any intervention so. Um, Sorry, these terms are wrong. It's like spot the deliberate mistake, isn't it, today? So I beg your pardon, ignore that. Is it a normal or an abnormal trace? I thought I'd, I thought I'd put this in, but obviously I haven't. It's abnormal, yes, yeah, lovely. It's what can, what does it, yeah, abnormal. What does it, what, how does anybody define that trace? What would you, how would you interpret it? Oh, my sinus, sinusoidal. Oh. Sinusoidal, yes, yeah, sinusoidal yeah. trace, lovely. So, um, and it's an unusual one. I put it in because it did happen, and it has happened around the state, but it's very, very unusual to see. So this was her outcome. Um, after a long discussion, she eventually agreed uh, that she needed the category one section, and, and it was a query, query of, of fetal maternal sort of bleed. So the baby was born, and it did quite well for a few minutes, and then it developed respiratory distress. And it, is, it, it sort of required CPAP, and its HB was 55, and it required a, a blood transfusion of 54 mils, and then it was warded with mum 24 hours later. So good blood gases, normal blood gases. So again, we didn't really know why this happened, um, with no idea, because to actually get a trace like that normally requires a massive mixing of fetal and maternal cells. And the only thing that they could come up with was that there'd been a, a silent abruption. Uh, she wasn't in pain when she came in. Um, she'd got no bleeding when she came in. There was a big retroplacental clot, and they just think it was a silent abruption. So very unusual. Um, she, uh, we kind of like get this type of thing from uh, more from people that are um, drug users with abruption and different things like that, but uh, very unusual, but a good outcome. Okay, so this is the last one that we're going to look at. What's our time looking like, Julie? Are we okay? Just 10 minutes. Yeah, we've got 10 minutes. 10 minutes. So this is a trace for, it's a 30 year old. Um, I'm just, just going, sorry, perhaps I just wanted to elaborate. 
Um, just that one was, uh, if anybody's not come across the sinusoidal trace, that was from fetal anemia, but I think most people are aware of that. So um, trace four, this is a 30-year-old woman. She's a, a multip, she's gravid of four, para two. Um, she's had um, two normal births and a miscarriage, two uncomplicated pregnancies. She's booked at a secondary hospital and she's a low-risk pregnancy. But she came to King Edward at 32 weeks gestation with a history of 62 hours of spontaneous rupture of membranes and diminished fetal movement. She states she's feeling unwell and she's felt unwell for the last two days. So um, let's pick on somebody else to get up and see who there is. Uh, who's not spoken? Bentley. Uh, I've Bentley spoken yet. Jump in, Bentley, and show me and tell me what your risk factors are. For the baby, what risks for the baby can you see from that history? Prematurity plus an infection. Yeah, lovely. Prematurity and infection. Well done, that's fantastic. Just stay on the line for a minute. You're the first person to see this trace. What's your management going to be? Bentley, do you want to continue on? Call for help. Yeah. Call for help. <laughs> yeah, <we are. laughs> Correct answer. Correct answer. Call for help. So um, perhaps give us a Dr. C. Bravado, seeing as you're going to call for help and you're going to be recording it. So give us a Dr. C. Bravado. So we've done the determined <laughs> risk. Um, well, reduced variability. That's tachycardia, I think, when you look at it from there. Yeah. yeah. And there's no acceleration. Yeah. No. Comment on your variability. What's your variability? Okay. It's less than five. Yeah. yeah. So it's reduced here, less than five. <laughs> and what about towards the middle and the end? Of that bit, some spaces see. that it might be a little bit better, but really, I mean, overall, yeah. it's very reduced. Yeah, it's absent, isn't it? In parts, yeah. less than three is absent, so it's nearly a straight line. But you did exactly the right thing, you called for help, which is fantastic. Yeah, called for help. So, what we used to do with this type of trace is we used to try to right the ship, if you like, we used to try to treat the infection and leave the baby where it was and improve the mum. We've actually, we don't do that anymore. Uh, we've discovered that to leave a baby in that hostile environment is not a great place for the baby to stay. So we actually tend to sort of like um, get the baby to sort of not be in that environment anymore. So again, it's thinking physiology, just thinking back to physiology. If you look at that sort of um, environment, this baby's now in a potentially bad septic or inflamed environment and it's um, I really don't like it when women have got flu type flu type symptoms um, I find that really sort of raises alarm bells for me even without spontaneous rupture of membranes or prematurity so yes completely correct get the help just I'm just going to stay there just for a second um, when you're teaching um, when you're actually teaching CTG to your junior members of staff um, I just want you to just actually always remember to start at the bottom of the trace and work up. So um, this one hasn't actually got any contractions. My arrow won't stay. <laughs> Come back arrow, I don't know where you've gone. So um, teach, trying to teach people to actually start at the bottom. And what I try to teach people to do is actually look at the end of a contraction uh, and then, well, first of all, looking at the, go back a step, looking at the beginning of the contraction. How do I get the arrow to come down, Julie? Sorry, <laughs> my text is going to help me today. Oh, Where's my arrow? Should, should have put a mouse on, shouldn't I? Oh, here we are. There it is. It's, it's hiding. So this isn't really a contraction, but pretend it is. So if you're teaching people how to, oh, it's disappeared again. <laughs> it seems to be when you sit over there, Julie, it disappears. Uh, oh, here it is. So look at the beginning of the contraction because that's when you've had the least amount of uterine activity. And go from there and go to the top and that will actually give you your baseline rate. So if you've got a whole heap of contractions, 
go to the beginning of the contraction, go to the top, and that'll be roughly where you've got the least amount of uterine activity, just prior to that contraction, and look look for your baseline rate, because you're trying to get your baseline rate when there's the least amount of activity. Then looking at your, um, if you're looking for decelerations, go to the end of your contraction, and uh, well, again, I can't do it with this now, so it's here, yeah, end of the contraction, go up and see whether it's back on its baseline rate. So that's to define whether it's a late or not. All right. So this is the next. This is the next page of the actual um, of the actual trace. So um, not Bentley this time. So the show that we've picked on Bentley. Let's pick on. Um, who can I pick on? Uh, who's not spoken? Anybody? Um, um, um. Armadale's not spoken. So Armadale, uh, you've got help. What are you thinking now? You've got this. Still looking at this trace. Armadale, what are you going to do next? Jump in. Okay, so we'd want fluids, we'd want a management plan, the baby's still tacky, the trace hasn't improved, have we, you know, changed position, all that sort of thing, done all the basic stuff, yeah. but yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like anything improved yeah. in that, so yeah. Probably, I think she's probably on antibiotics already. Um, we're quite keen on getting blood cultures now if we can, just so that it gives us, I mean, it doesn't give us anything immediate, but it's just to help to make sure that we're on track with how we're treating things. Yeah, so all that, that's great. What else, Armadale, what do you think is going to happen next? What would you do in Armadale with that trace? Uh, yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd need a plan for delivery. Yeah, yeah. Would you transfer out or would you keep? And, uh, At 30 know. weeks, if she was stable, we would transfer out. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's good thinking to kind of like um, rally your next team around and get that baby out as quick as possible. But that would be, to, that would be your obstetrician, obstetrician and neonatologist or paediatrician to discuss which way to go with that. Uh, but there is great evidence. It's like one of those every second counts type things with this sort of sepsis. Um, there's kind of a graph that shows you the longer the baby's in that environment, the greater the chance it has of actually developing some long-term problems. And it seems to develop cerebral palsy. So there would be some criticism if you didn't actually um, get this baby out as quick as possible. And there'd probably be some criticism also if you didn't mobilise the next team. Um, I'll just make them alert as to what's going on. But again, that wouldn't be your decision. It would be for the decision of the obstetric and paediatric team. Okay, so who else has not, um, who else has not actually sort of commented on anything today? Can you remember, Julie? You're good at remembering who's not commented. We're not very good at picking on people, are we? All right, we can't decide. Jump, ju jump in, anybody? Anybody jump in and tell me what, how you would actually define or how you would interpret those decelerations? Just give them a name. Come on, you all know what they are. I'm going to call them late. You're going to call them late. Good. So let's just get to the, um, I'll just have to use my pen. So I'm actually going from the bottom to the top. Anybody want to disagree? You're allowed to disagree. No, we think it's variable. Yeah? We think Anybody it's variable. Anybody want to disagree? All right, variable. Anybody want to disagree on variable? You've got, you've got a few more. You've got another option. What's the other option? Late, early, variable, complicated variable, prolonged. Anybody want to give me a different different one? It doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, because your management's the same. Complicated variable. Beautiful, thank you, yeah. Why would you say the complicated variable? Because that's what they are. Why? There's no, no regular pattern, a bit of an overshoot yeah. after a couple of yeah. them, like a shoulder, yeah. um, and the, yeah, no, no regularity to them. Yeah. So that's anybody want to anybody want to add to that? Because there's another reason why they're complicated. But you're right. You've got all that right. Why else are they complicated? Think about what else. Maybe two more reasons. Um, the yeah. 
the baseline got fetal is... Tachycardia. Yeah. Yeah. Fetal tachycardia reduced variability, causes them to be complicated variables. You don't have to have all those features, uh, you only have to have one, and the reality is that uh, it doesn't matter if you've called them late or complicated variables, what is important is your management, so don't get too het up about that. Variables tend to be V-shaped and, um, and I would agree with you that there is a late deceleration as well as a complicated variable uh, towards the end. I think that's where Albany was um, hot, to, hot to see that late deceleration as well. I've just gone too far. This, I'm going to get a mouse next time. Yeah. But that one at the end is definitely a late. Well done, Albany. Well done, whoever called them complicated variables. Management is just the same. Don't get head up about it. It's all the same. So they've left this baby too long already. This baby could be in transfer going to the Stanley or well, it would be King Edward, I would think. Uh, and you might end up with a stillborn baby. That's the, that's the thing about this trace because it's actually now absent variability. Can you see that? It's deteriorated. And you wouldn't pick that up in a transfer because you're not going to be able to continually monitor. So it's just something to consider with management to actually retrieve that baby quite quickly. Okay, so they do do a CAT1 section eventually. APGARs are poor, 3, 5 and 5. Uh, birth weight 2010, which is pretty good for its gestation. Needs, um, it needs ET tube, it needs surfactant. Um, there's no growth on the cultures eventually. But the thing that's really a bad outcome for this, are the gases are all really bad. Okay, can everybody see that? I'm, I, today we haven't got time to do gases, but anything above 7.1 is normal for an arterial blood gas. So this baby is actually acidotic. It's also got a high PCO2, normally 73, and it's 89, and it's also got a base excess of minus 12. So it's got a mixed, um, it's got an acute mixed. Um, blood gas of sort of incorporating respiratory and lactate. So it's a bad outcome. It should have been birthed probably a little earlier than this. Um, so that's any questions about that? Just a fast track through, just trying to get you thinking about physiology, thinking about inflammation, thinking about sepsis, thinking about management, thinking about looking after yourself. Any questions before I summarise? Because I know that we've... What time is it? Oh, it's 2.30. 2.30. We've got time to finish. So just think about the dirty dozen. Look about communication, your, whether you're complacent, any knowledge, any knowledge gaps. Think about when you work, um, as you, are you easily distracted, fatigued, stressed? Think about your teamwork, think about your resources. Think about your awareness and think about getting drawn into what's normed that can be a problem for you. So just look at your whole clinical picture, make sure your physiology independent your actual management, think about the baby, not the CCG, get that baby reviewed with fresh, independent eyes and become a bit more of your dirty dozen. Can I just say thanks everybody for hanging in, thanks everybody for your full attention and if you want this presentation you, you can definitely have it. And if you want that, um, just the Dirty Dozen um, um, article that I've got a base this on, you're more than welcome for that too. So thanks, everybody. Well done. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I have a quick question, Joan. Thank you. Um, you're, you're, yes, you're happy that I run this, uh, in service with your PowerPoint? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. More than more than welcome for anybody to use this PowerPoint, you, and you can modify it to your own to your own need. Absolutely, I'm happy for it to go out to all the sites that we've had today. Okay, it's also been it's also been recorded, yeah. so you'll be able to access it um, as a recorded as a recorded. Can you um, stop the recording for sixty two six eight? Right. So it will be recorded and available to you all.